Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Last night, I spoke at Arizona State University, and along with Charlie Kirk, the founder of TPUSA, Turning Point USA. I think there were 350 or so students there. Charlie told me that ASU would not allow him to have a bigger venue. I think if it was a left-wing group, they would have given him a bigger venue. There were about 200 students turned away. Just thought you ought to know about that. And I'll give you more of a report on it. Last night was another Republican debate. The uh, woman that I do the Dennis and Julie podcast with and who does her own podcast on the Salem Radio Network, Timeless, Julie Hartman, I just learned was there. So I have her on the line. Hi, Dennis. Whom did you meet? Oh, my gosh. The the better question is, whom didn't I meet? I met Carrie Lake, uh, all of the candidates I was able to speak with, even if just for a few seconds afterwards. I unfortunately met Governor Gavin Newsom, who was strangely there. I asked him why he was there. Um, we were huddled in a crowd of reporters, and he said, I'm here to defend the Biden administration. He also said that that the Biden administration, both the president and the vice president, asked him to come, which is a bit strange because obviously he wasn't up on the stage. I met Sean Hannity, who's lovely. I spoke with Dana Bash. She was next to me in the spin room, Um, though I don't agree with her politics. She was also lovely. It was it was a very fascinating night. All right. And what did you think of the debate itself? Frankly, Dennis, I thought a lot of it was embarrassing. There were some really what I would call cringe moments throughout the night. First of all, I thought that the questions were really not great. Dana Perino is under fire for a question that she asked where she asked the candidates, if there is one of you up here who you would vote off the island who would you vote to remove from the stage? And to his credit, Governor Ron DeSantis cut in and said, come on, this is childish. This is not who we are. Let's let's talk about issues pertaining to the country. That was a bit of an embarrassing moment. Chris Christie had a joke that I can tell you from sitting in the audience flopped. He said that uh, Donald Trump is behaving so terribly that soon people are going to start calling him Donald Duck. No one laughed at that. In fact, many people cringed at it. And to make matters even weirder, Chris Christie made a joke about how President Biden is, quote, sleeping with a member of a teacher's union. I assume that he was referring to uh, Jill Biden, the first lady. I I know that she's uh, a professor. I didn't know she was a member of a teacher's union. And then former Vice President Mike Pence cuts in and says, well, I've been sleeping with a teacher for 38 years, i.e. his own wife, who also I didn't know was a teacher. The point in my telling you this, Dennis, is that it was there were many of those moments which had nothing to do with the many issues plaguing our country. They were childish, and it just seemed like it was more entertainment and not a what it what it is supposed to be, which is showing the American people their options for the next commander in chief. Did, it, did anybody look like a serious presidential individual? Governor Ron DeSantis was by far the most presidential individual mm-hmm. up on that stage. Wait. He has a very good way of cutting through the fray and getting to the issues. Someone uh, who is close to me, whose name I just won't mention, and who, I, whose opinion I respect said the exact same thing and is not a fan of DeSantis. I happen to think very highly of Ron DeSantis, but that, that that's not the, the point. I think uh, highly of a number of them, but 
I certainly do of him. So uh, your opinion seems to have been widespread, and it's not just that person. It, it was uh, the the general consensus of commentators was that Ron DeSantis looked, quote-unquote, presidential. When yes. I, I was disappointed, because I have great respect for Nikki Haley, and mm-hmm. I was disappointed at the comment that she made that the more Vivek Ravaswamy speaks, the dumber she becomes. Yeah. How, how did that line go over? It didn't, well, people in the audience chuckled a little bit. I think that there is a growing contingent in the Republican Party that is not too enamored with Vivek. Frankly, I don't quite understand it. I think Vivek is an, is an excellent candidate. I think that the things that he talks about are, are bold and, and needed. But yes, that was that was a really low moment. And the, and the thing, Dennis, that was sad was up until that point, Nikki Haley, I thought, was performing beautifully. I actually tweeted so far. Nikki Haley is the standout. And then she said that about Vivek. And by the way, the point that she was making, they were talking about why Vivek Ramaswamy was on TikTok. Now, I don't use TikTok because of its ties to the Chinese Communist Party, but Vivek was asked about why he goes on TikTok, and he gave what I thought was a very appropriate answer that we need to win. We need to reach the younger generation in order to combat the Chinese. And if using TikTok is a way to do it, I want to use their own tool against them. And so I just thought Nikki Haley should have respectfully disagreed with that. She said that that Vivek should not be using TikTok. But to resort to these personal attacks, it did not make her look good, to your point. It's, it seems to me that the only person adversely affected by these insults is the person who makes the insult. Why, yeah. why isn't it obvious to them? Why, why is it only obvious to us? That's not just in politics. You're absolutely right. Also, this to use the cliché, if it becomes a circular firing squad, it just benefits the people who are tearing down America, the Democrats. Absolutely. And and most of the night was just the candidates yelling over one another. The format of these debates, I think, needs to be changed a bit, including turning off a person's Yes, life. no, that, that's clearly, they're, they're, that is the only way. You can't keep saying your time is up, your time is up. Also, the amount of time, uh, I, I didn't watch the whole thing because I was in Arizona at, at ASU, but I did watch a, a fair amount. And, f- for example, the this extended attack on Vivek Rawaswamy uh, by Nikki Haley, and then finally he gets to respond, and the moderator says, you have 15 seconds. Yes, it was very poorly organized. I will quickly tell you some highlights of uh, some some points that the candidates made pertaining to the issues, which is what we should all be focused on after all. I thought Nikki Haley made a good point about China. She said that President Trump had a good policy with China to focus on trade, but that we need to shift our attention to China buying our farmland, establishing the spy base off the base uh, or, or off of Cuba, the fentanyl crisis. I thought that she was strong on that. Vivek had a great line about victimhood, the epidemic of victimhood in this country. That's where I think he's particularly strong, speaking about the culture issues. And Governor DeSantis, he said this in the last debate, but he reiterated that if he were president, he would go into Mexico, send drones or other uh, weaponry to eliminate the Mexican drug cartels, which he classifies as a terrorist group. So look, despite all of the... Uh, arguing and the cringy moments. I'm actually excited for the future of the Republican Party because we have some candidates who I think will lead us in a good direction in 2024 and beyond. And I'm not sure the Democratic Party has counterparts like that. Well, they have Gavin Newsom, I mean, you're, you're a, man of, a man of depth. By the way, the victimhood, uh, I'll, I'll read the exact victimhood line from Rawa Swami. And I, I think I agree with you. I isolated that. I've been through hardship growing up. My father stared down layoffs at GE under Jack Welch's tenure at the GE plant in Evandale, Ohio. 
My mom had to work overtime in nursing homes in southwest Ohio to make ends meet and pay off her home loan. So I understand that hardship is not a choice, but victimhood is a choice. And we choose to be victorious in the United States of America. If I was giving advice to those workers, those the ones who were on strike, the auto workers, I would go say I would say go picket in front of the White House in Washington D.C. That's really where the protests need to be. Disastrous economic policies that have driven up prices, that have driven up interest rates and mortgage rates, at the same time wages remaining stagnant. I'll have one more line from that, but I love what he said. Hardship is not a choice. Victimhood is a choice. You, you and I picked the same, same line there. We'll be back in a moment. I'm speaking to Julie Hartman. Natural disasters, airline cancellations, and runway near misses, supply chain issues, inflation, rising interest rates, and sky-high government debt. This is Dennis Prager for AmFed Coin and Bullion. There's a lot in the news about what consumers cannot control. So let's talk about what you can control. You can control how you choose to invest and protect your wealth. That's why I choose to do business with Nick Grovich and his company, AmFed Coin and Bullion. Now is a great time to own tangible assets like gold, silver, and platinum. With over 41 years' experience and tens of thousands of satisfied clients, Nick will help you make informed decisions and show you smart choices, which have been proven winners time and time again. AmFed Coin and Bullion will sell you the right types of precious metals to get the maximum value for your money. Take control of your investments like I did. Call Nick and his team at AmFed Coin and Bullion at 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. Whenever I'm down, I call on you, my friend. A helping hand you lend in my time of need. Whenever I'm down... If you don't know about uh, Dennis and Julie... It is the first time in my life of 40 years of broadcasting I actually have a co-host of a show. That is how highly I regard her and how good the interaction is between us. So go go uh, and uh, watch it. We have uh, how many how many episodes do we have, Julie? I believe 80 or 81. Unbelievable. So again, it's called Dennis and Julie. And Julie was at, Julie Hartman was at the debate last night. What, what was the mood like? Mm. You know, I was spending a lot of time in the spin room, which is the media room with all of the um, reporters. <laughs> I don't know if I call myself a reporter, but I was taking the, the position of a reporter last night. And I'll tell you a story, Dennis, that was really interesting. So whenever the candidates after the, the debate, of course, when they, when they go into the spin room, whenever the candidates would walk by the press area, of course, all of us would be clamoring to speak with them, yelling, Vivek, Governor DeSantis, please come. You know, we have this question for you. It was really interesting when Vice President Pence walked by. He was one of the last people to come out of the the debate stage and into the spin room. When Vice President Pence walked by, no one yelled out his name. None of us. And that was the only candidate for whom that was the case. And that really hit me because I thought, you know, here we have the former Vice President of the United States within a two feet of us willing to answer questions and none of us seem excited to have that opportunity and i think it indicated that the energy around him is low i don't think that a lot of the american people are particularly excited by him and think that he is a bit outdated in his positions and in his time politically wow uh, that that's quite an anecdote. So, a- anybody else who would pass by, there was a clamoring for the person's attention. Vivek Ramaswamy was mobbed. I is actually, that right? Was, that's fascinating. Yes, if you go to my Instagram at Julie R Hartman, shameless plug, but you should all of you no, should no, really no, no, it's good. It's, uh, Julie R Hartman, H A R T M A N. Yeah, go on. You, you 
have to see this photo. I posted it on my Instagram story. I have a photo of Vivek, and he is literally, he has like 50 uh, microphones and cameras in his face. He was being mobbed. DeSantis was being mobbed, but Vivek uh, by a landslide. Even though you felt, and and many others did, that uh, it was DeSantis who looked the most presidential, it, why do you think Vivek got the most attention in, in, with regard to the media, at least at the event? Because I think that he is bold and courageous, and he has. Look, it, it is certainly true that Governor DeSantis was the most presidential in his demeanor and with his talking points. But Vivek brings a lot of energy and vitality to the Republican Party. He certainly does not mince words with how he feels about the administrative state, about the climate change agenda, which he called a hoax in the last debate. I think also it's great that he's a minority candidate. He came from, you know, a working class background. He really rose through the ranks. He went to Harvard and Yale Law. He's I think he's worth close to a billion dollars. He's a businessman. And so I think there's a lot to admire with Vivek and The key thing, though, is the vitality, because he is the future of the Republican Party. Wow, that's worth it in itself to to have gotten your report. What do you think of the reporters? Well, as I mentioned, you know, Sean Hannity was really nice. Dana Bash was really nice. But I was with the the non-major network reporters. And boy, Dennis, they're vicious. They've got sharp elbows. They will knock you over to get to a candidate. And by the way, someone, uh, I, I was telling you how much Vivek was of interest. Someone literally got knocked over as a reporter was trying to get um, a statement from Vivek. Well, that's fascinating. There was an interesting article I read somewhere in the, the you know, as you know, the vast <laughs> uh, forest of articles available and it was from an, an Indian American, Indian mean, meaning from India, an Indian American left winger who was so angry uh, that Nikki Haley and Vivek Rawaswamy are prominent Republicans, prominent conservatives, both coming from Indian backgrounds. Uh, she, in her case, her parents, I believe, are Sikh, and uh, I, I assume Vivek's parents are Hindu. So uh, it it what puzzles me, and I'm not I'm not even asking you for an explanation though. If you have a thought, I'd love to hear it. It is a phenomenon to me that there would be any Indian American leftist. They come to the United States, or their parents come to the United States, prosper in a way that would have been impossible in India, and then they crap on it as a leftist. It's it's truly it's a psychological or psychopathological phenomenon. Did we lose Julie? Oh, sorry. I think I accidentally muted myself. Forgive me. That, that's an interesting point. The, the final thing I'll say is, I find it to be interesting whenever someone smears a candidate for being a Republican because that candidate is a minority. You know, we hear the left talk about we have to amplify the voices of minorities, protect minorities, but that that becomes suspended when they politically disagree with the left. Then they're fake minorities. Then they're Uncle Toms, in the case of Clarence Thomas, or traitors to their race. Isn't that an interesting dynamic, Dennis? So it's not shocking, sadly, to hear that, that those um, have been leveled against Vivek and Nikki Haley. You, you know, I'll tell you another interesting thing. The The diversity party doesn't seem to be as diverse a, a, as the Republicans. Two two from India, uh, one one black. A woman. A woman. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, oh, she's one of those from India. Right. A woman. Right. And, and no Republican cares. Wow. 
When the government used emergency edicts during COVID to restrict the gathering and worship of churches, three pastors faced the risk of imprisonment, unlimited fines, and their own churches being ripped apart. But they took a courageous stand and reopened their doors in the face of a world that chose to comply. The Essential Church is a feature-length documentary that explores the struggle between the church and government throughout history. The story uncovers those who have sacrificed their lives throughout history for what they believe in. Rediscover why the church is essential and how we can prove that this stand remains true from a scientific, legal, and most importantly, biblical perspective. This is not your typical movie. You should see the movie with your friends and family. The Essential Church is streaming today exclusively at SalemNow.com. That's Essential Church. SalemNow.com. Streaming at SalemNow.com. Speaking with Julie Hartman, who was at the debate last night. I just want to finish the Ravaswamy quote that we both fascinatingly thought highly of. By the way, it is so, there is a line here that is so profound that it should actually uh, be used and memorized. And let me uh, get that for you. Yes. I understand that hardship is not a choice. But victimhood is a choice. I mean, that's profound. I think that is the thesis statement of the Republican Party and of conservatism. You know, because I read your Torah commentary, Dennis, I know that early on in Genesis, God tells, I believe it's Cain or, or Adam, I, I think it's Cain, the urge to evil is yes, within Cain. you, yet, mm-hmm. yet you have the power to master it. That is Judeo-Christian values, that is conservatism, and that is the Republican Party. And that is why I think Vivek Ramaswamy, for our earlier conversation, is being mobbed by the reporters and ascending in the polls. People love hearing stuff like that. It is empowering. I know that's a corny, overused word, but it is empowering to hear that, especially from a young person who has demonstrated it himself. He did not return any insults. Is that correct? I'm not sure about that. I, I, I think that's correct. You know, last time Vivek was criticized for being too brazen. He called his uh, fellow co- competitors, or his, I should say, not fellow, his competitors, uh, super PAC puppets. He said that they were bought and paid for. So it oh, was so, good okay. to see uh-huh. the- okay. But that was the last debate. I think he purposefully changed course this debate good, in good. a pretty deal. When you, when you insult your allies, all you do is help your enemies. And, and I think degrade yourself, to, to be honest. So a one final question. Was Donald Trump... Was his presence felt the whole time, or is that not the case? At least from my perspective. I mean, as I mentioned, Governor Christie made that terrible joke about Donald, Donald Duck. Trump. I, couldn't, I can't believe it. Well, I, look, I'm so not a Christie fan that... Uh, I know. Not, yeah, anyway, go on. No, I, I, I concur. Uh, Governor DeSantis said that Donald Trump should be here, but besides that, I don't recall an instance where his name was mentioned. And I think that was a good thing. And no, I mean, no one really even talked about it. In the audience, in the spin room, I I didn't hear anyone mention the name Trump. Well, but uh, DeSantis, and uh, I don't remember who else, uh, in my reading uh, of it, as opposed to watching, because I was at Arizona State last night, uh, there were comments of, he should be here. Right, yes. Yes. So what, when I when I asked you, was his presence hovering over the evening? I, I mean it not just among the debaters, but um, among the spectators. I, I mean, or this is purely a feeling question. Or, or was, what, was the was focus? No uh, forgive me. Was the focus only, or essentially only, on the debaters? 
What was that? Yes? Yes. There was no uh-huh. mention or feeling uh-huh. about Donald Trump, at least among the people I was around. Right. You happy you went? Well, I'm, 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 losing, say- I'm losing you. Oh. Okay. Yes, I'm sure you're, right. you're unlost. I'm I'm thrilled that I went, but seeing Governor Newsom was terrifying <laughs> in the flesh. All right, we'll talk about that on Dennis and Julie. Yes. Okay, thanks, thanks a million. This, this was a very helpful report. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, it, it's I'm living through an age where one party is is only destroying. All it does is destroy. And with all the flaws of the other party, because it's, it's flawed because it's made up of human. Humans are flawed. It, it's so remarkable to me that a party that advocates, advocates that if a child says he or she is of the opposite sex, they be given life-altering hormone block, blockers and then, and then horrible surgeries, that that party gets half of the American people's votes. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop at the pillow. Mike also created the Giza Dream bed sheets. These sheets look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep, which is crucial for overall health. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's latest deal is the sale of the year for a limited time. You'll receive 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets, marking prices down as low as $29.98, depending on the size. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the Radio Podcasts Square, and use the promo code Prager. There you'll find not only this amazing offer, but also deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow 2.0 mattress topper, MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and so much more. Call 800-761-6302 or go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code Prager. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. I talked about the Republican debate last night and other matters. And now we go back a few centuries with Bill O'Reilly. I want to say, and I am not paid to say this, I have no reason to say it other than it's true. This is one of the best ways to learn history I know of, the Killing Series by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard. They're really extraordinary, and I'll tell, I'll tell you why they're extraordinary. I'm not telling Bill. I, I suspect he knows, but I'm telling you, and obviously history was my major, and I, I, I love this stuff because if you don't know history, you don't know anything. I mean that uh, quite literally. I mean, I'm not talking about botany or chemistry, but about life. And one, one reason is there's no superfluous information. Uh, the, about 25, 30 years ago, people writing history books decided that everything they know about the subject should be in the book. And so Chester Arthur uh, had uh, bacon uh, that lunch. And uh, it, it might be interesting once, but 800 pages of that stuff is means that the author doesn't know what is truly significant. It's just... So he, he uh, these two guys, O'Reilly and Dugard, know what's significant, and they put it in. It's extremely well-researched, and it's extremely interesting, and interesting is the key to all communication. So how is that, Bill O'Reilly? I think that'll be, uh, you know, I felt like it was in Prager U. I, I felt like, you know, the, <laughs> the principal was giving uh-huh. me props. You know, that's a good thing. That's right. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I, uh, that's a very sweet compliment from you. Anyway, before we get into the latest, which is Killing the Witches, the horror of Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm going to be curious to know if, if there's any connection to events of the day and why you chose this one. It just came out two days ago by friends up at DennisPrager.com. You can obviously go 
to any place you order books and get it. It's called Killing the Witches, about uh, horror, uh, the horror of Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, so did you watch the debate? No. I got a transcript of it. Uh huh. Me the too. I, yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I didn't watch it was because at the same time, Tucker Carlson was interviewing me. Right. And, and I, 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 it's very funny. Twitter. And my reason was I was speaking to hundreds of students at Arizona State University. <laughs> so we no, both had decent yes, reasons. Very. We both had good reasons. Exactly right. right. Uh, but still, do you have any, uh, any takeaway? I, I, sure. I, yeah. Go ahead. It was a very important debate because it solidifies the fact that none of those people, the seven people on the stage, are going to beat Donald Trump in the Republican primary. So they don't have any chance uh, unless Trump, something more happens that he's disqualified from running. So Trump has got it. Trump locked it down last night. And the reason is it's not really fair to the seven challengers because Where are they going to go? Um, Yeah, you can make fun of Trump, but he's not there. Uh, Yeah, you can say you're better than Trump, but Trump, in Republican circles, ran a pretty good White House for four years. Every all the polls show that if it weren't for Trump's dubious personality, he would have been president for another term already. And with the chaos in the Democratic precincts, he may be reelected. And and again, COVID. If it weren't for the the, the panic over COVID, COVID. And, and all the suspending of normal election rules, he I think he would have right. been president as well. Uh, it, it seems like events just conspired to deprive him of of the presidency. And 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 I'm I'm not I I of course I was anti never Trumpers, but I'm also anti all. Only Trumpers. Uh, so uh, I, this is not coming from, you know, someone who believes only Trump c- uh, can uh, win or only Trump uh, should run. So we, we have we have a very similar take. Is there any connection between your book coming out now and events of today? Oh, the reason I wrote Killing the Witches is because of the cancel culture today. A hundred percent. So this is the 13th killing book. And if you read them all, then you know about your country. But what I didn't write about was the actual origins. So we open with the Mayflower, okay? And the harrowing 66-day voyage, 100 people on there. They got booted out of England by the king because they were religious fanatics. And you don't want to be, Dennis, on the Mayflower. So we all hear pilgrims, Thanksgiving passes stuffing. No. This was a horrendous trip. And then when they get to Massachusetts, they're at each other's throats. Half of them die. So we go through that, which led to this unbelievable religious fervor, fanaticism, zealotry that took root and led to the executions of 20 human beings and the incarceration of more than 200 in Salem, Massachusetts. And when you see what actually happened there, the hysteria, the lack of due process. There was these people once accused you were guilty unless you confessed. You had a way out of being killed if you said, yeah, I'm a witch. Yeah. OK. And a lot of them did that. And what ha- what and happened to like, you then if you said you were a witch? Banished. Banished. Um, you were pretty much marginalized. The preachers would come in and say, OK, we're going to pray for her soul or her soul, whatever it may be. But you were over. And when you were accused of being a witch, the authorities seize your property. So there was an economic component about all this witchcraft. Fast forward to today, because the, the last third of Killing the Witches is about modern times. And there's two aspects to it. The cancel culture, driven by the corrupt corporate media and the insane Internet people, deprive Americans of due process. An accusation means a conviction. You're through. The most vivid example we have in the book is this young teacher in Northern Virginia, okay, 25 years old, is accused by a student of impropriety. They fire her. She's arrested. Her whole life is ruined. And two weeks later, the charges are dropped because there's no evidence. 
Now, she sued and got $5 million. The jury took a half hour to give her $5 million. But her whole life to this day is destroyed. And I got example after example after example. So we have a cancel culture that is depriving Americans of due process and putting us all in fear. The reason that cable and network news on television has declined so much in audience is because the people on television are afraid, Dennis. They're afraid. And this fear... Wait, uh, af- afraid of what? Afraid of what? Nation. Getting canceled. You know, every day of my life, I've been doing news commentary now for 27 years. Every day, including today, I've been attacked by somebody somewhere. And it's very hard to live that way. Hmm. Well, that's, I'm very happy I asked you the question. We, I'll tell you another interesting uh, parallel that I see in our time about something th- that we regarded like the witch trials, which take place now, the uh, the clitoridectomies, the, the the removal of girls' clitorises in in uh, in parts of the Muslim world. I mean, mil- millions and millions of girls. Ayan Hirsi Ali writes about this, uh, about it happening to her. This this brilliant, uh, extraordinary woman uh, uh, in Somalia, and uh, now we're doing our form of mutilation of children. With, with teenagers having their breasts taken off, boys being castrated if they just say the words, I am the other sex or the other gender. So it, it's, like, it's like the witch trials don't end. It, it's like uh, mutilation of, of uh, girls and boys doesn't end. It just takes another form. The problem is that if you speak out against this, you will be attacked. And you will be slimed and smeared. So in Salem, Massachusetts, in 1692, there were good people who said, this is insane. You can't be hanging, you know, our neighbors based on a nine-year-old's testimony that makes no sense. As soon as you stood up against that, they accused you of being a witch. You were in jail. And if you go against the progressive cancel culture they're coming for you they're going to get rid of you so it's the parallel and that is why i this is i said 13th killing book i said i'm going to write this book in a way that's so vivid so shocking Mm -hmm. that everybody will finally know what's happening today we face killing the the, let me tell everybody the killing the witches is the book the horror of salem massachusetts Bill O'Reilly, Martin Dugard at DennisPrager.com. I was talking to Bill O'Reilly about the Salem witch trials and how we laugh at the people at that, at that time believing in witches. We have... Tell me... I'm very curious, which is the more insane, crazed, weird lie that there are witches or that men give birth? If you say men give birth, you have no right to condemn people for believing in witches. They believed in the in a popular lie in their time. And there are many Americans who believe in the popular lie of our time, including many medical groups. American Association of, uh, what is it, Pediatric Medicine, or whatever their official name is. You say you're the other sex, and you are. One of the professors at Arizona State University who condemned the university for having Charlie Kirk and myself speak there earlier this year. We just spoke again last night. Uh, goes by they. This is a really impressive individual who wrote a book 
I can't say the word on on radio, on non-private radio, but it's how to F a Kraken with the actual word. And the word is spelled out on the Arizona State University website describing the professor. Don't laugh at the witch trials if you take the current witch trial people seriously. <laughs> I've I've said this all of my life. You you know if a person is morally trustworthy in their judgment by their ability to discern evil in their time. It is effortless and takes no courage to identify evils of the past. The entire test of a person's moral compass is the ability to discern evils of the present. That the left did not think communism was evil? Still many don't. Tells you all you need to know about the moral compass of the left. There is, not even including the mutilation of boys and girls who say they are not boys or girls. The trick is to identify today's evils. Identifying yesterday's evils is not exactly courageous. Because you pay a price if you identify today's evils. That's what that's the failure of the liberal. The liberal shares almost no values with the leftist. But they don't have the courage to confront the left. So, Bill O'Reilly, I was uh, making the case for <laughs> the, uh, the wrongness of condemning people then believing in witches when people today believe that men give birth. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure which is the more absurd belief. Look, what happens is that um, people... Are afraid. When people are afraid, Dennis, then they are more susceptible to insane occurrences or accepting, accepting things they should not accept. Because they, it's like to go along, to get along. You know, I, I don't want to say anything about the, the boy who wants to be a girl who's in a swimming competition with the other girls because then somebody might call me a homophobe or a name and I don't want that. And I'm trying to mobilize people, and I think you are too, um, to stop. you got to stand up. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's exactly right. So that, that's why there is a, a, a contemporary timeliness to your book and uh, of yeah. Bill O'Reilly, which is the, it's the latest The Killing series on uh, killing witches, the horror of Salem, Massachusetts. How many, how many were actually killed, and how long did these trials take place? 20 human beings were killed. Were they all women? Uh, no, a couple of guys. And So uh, wait, wait, forgive they, me, a man could be a witch? Oh, yeah. Okay. So now they call them warlocks, but back then they were all witches. Okay. See, if, in order to be a witch, you had to be in the league with the devil. You had to be possessed by the devil. The devil was forcing you to hurt these little girls, to hurt whatever. All right, that, That's what the definition of witchcraft was. In Europe, they used witchcraft in wars to kill the other religions. So the Protestants are fighting the Catholics, and they both were burning people at the stake. They didn't burn people in the New World because England considered witchcraft to be a civil crime against the crown, not a religious crime. And that was the difference. So here, you didn't get burned. A lot of people think these witches were burned at Salem. They were hung, 20 of them. But hundreds were imprisoned, and some of the people died in the jails because they were horrible back then, of course, you can imagine. Um, so this situation got out of control so quickly, and the trials would take anywhere from a week to 10 days, and you had a rope around your neck. So they were hanged. Yeah, why, why do people believe they were burned? Because thousands were burned in Europe. So we opened the book in the preamble to the book in Scotland, 
where this wealthy woman, widow, was burned at the stake because King James of England, who controlled Scotland, wanted her land. So somebody came in, accused her of being a witch. A week later, she's at the stake. Everybody in Edinburgh is throwing little uh, boughs on the, on the fire, and she goes up. But in England itself, mm-hmm. kings banned All right, can, can you stay on with me, or you got to go? No, I'm, I'm here. Okay, Killing the Witches, the Horror of Salem, Massachusetts, the latest in the Killing series, a terrific way to learn history. Back in a moment. Speaking with Bill O'Reilly has one of the most effective ways of learning history. It's 13th book in his Killing series. I have read a few of them. I intend to read all of them, believe it or not. My This young woman that I do a podcast with, Julie Hartman, read your uh, Killing, was it the SS? Is that the name of the book? Yeah, Killing the SS. She, she, she said, she. I think she read it in one evening, and, and she said, not only did she learn an immense amount, but it it stayed with her. She had a such an acute sense of what these Nazis were like after reading your book. I mean, people really live what you write about. It, it's 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 really an achievement. So uh, the the witch was a person who was regarded as having some collusion with the devil. Right. So that that's helpful for people to understand. Right. Now, and yeah, go ahead. We brought it into modern times. And by the way, I specialize, and I don't know why, about uh, vividly portraying evil. I know, I know why. I, I, yes, that's right. Well said. I will tell her that you said that. I think I know why you do. I think, I think like me, and, and not only us, obviously, you hate evil, and so do I. We, we're all flawed characters, but evil is evil. Flaws are flaws. Evil is evil. That's there, right. And uh, so I believe this says a lot about you, that you care to depict evil. So I salute you for well, it. I was, I was put on this planet for a reason. I'm a believer, as you are. And I think the reason I was put here was to fight and expose evil. And if you read uh, my books, you know, Killing the SS, Killing the Mob, all right, and now Killing the Witches, that we are very good at uh, defining and uh, writing in a way that, as you said, Julie doesn't forget it, stays with her. Now, what I did in Killing the Witches, in addition to uh, correlating the executions in Salem with the counterculture today, the cancel culture, uh, all driven by the left, by the way. You don't see conservative traditional people entering into the ca- cancel culture. It's all coming from one group. I also got into demonic possession today, and we examined the real exorcist uh, based on the film. And it wasn't a girl, it was a boy, a 13-year-old girl, uh, boy in Maryland named Ronald Hunkler. And we uh, told you his real story uh, took three months, eight Jesuit priests, harrowing. We got the diaries of the priests. Um, and if you're non believer and you read this, you might rethink it. So, and then we went to the movie set, which everybody has seen or heard of the movie The Exorcist, um, uh, directed by a guy who didn't have any belief in any god or devil. And eight people associated with the movie during the filming died, in addition to unbelievable stuff happening on the sets. And the actors and actresses and directors were like stunned every day that this was happening. So all of that is chronicled in Killing the Witches. Um, And I want the reader to draw his or her own conclusions, but I want them to recognize that evil does exist in the world, Dennis, as you know. Yes, in fact, I wrote a column. I write a weekly column. I have literally 1,000 up on the internet, and my 
uh, one of my most recent columns was about the fact that young people don't know about evil. That, uh, you know, 45% of young people, we're talking about under 35, not, not 15, uh, never heard of Auschwitz. And I would suspect 80% never heard of the Gulag. And if you don't know, if, if you don't know those two things, you don't know anything. Teachers in public schools are absolutely petrified of uh, any moral lessons. That's what this is all about. So when you and I were in, in grammar school, I went to Catholic school. I mean, it was all about good and evil in Catholic school. If you eat meat on Friday, you're going to fry. And I, I'm wondering what happened to those poor people who ate meat on Friday. And they're like, ah, you can eat meat on Friday. They're not making a joke out of it, but... but the lessons the nuns imparted when I was seven, eight years old was good and evil. That's what it was every day. Now you go to public school and there's an ambivalence about it, and most teachers are frightened to even bring it up. Oh, America's evil. Because they're going to oh, get they, they believe in good and evil, but it's backwards. Okay, the, <laughs> you know, no, I agree right. with you entirely. Not real good I'm and evil. I'm talking about personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm no, talking no, about personal. And personal. Right. All right, back in a moment. Trump, k- k- hold on. Killing the witches. Sure. The latest in in this remarkable series by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard. Bill O'Reilly, latest book, just came out two days ago in the Killing series, Killing the Witches, the tragic relevance for today. So I'm I'm going to take uh, the uh, audacity, or chutzpah, as uh, Jews might say, although chutzpah is now international, uh, and suggest to you in, in, in a future killing series uh, something to the effect, killing class enemies, I, I have no title for you, but pe- in light of the ignorance of the communist genocides of the 20th century, I mean, you could do Cambodia alone, you could do China alone, you could do the Soviet Union, you could do Ukraine, but that you have such a large audience, it would be a moral service to humanity for you to do something about the communist mass murders of the 20th century. It's an excellent uh, topic for a book, um, and we could uncover a lot of things that led to it, because that, that's the point of what you and I, and we're in this uh, culture war together, Prager, whether you like it or not. You, uh, you're uh, ally with me, I'm uh, ally with uh, you. Uh, I'm fine with it, believe me. It's all about awareness. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to look the other way, as the Chinese did, the Chinese people did after World War II, Chiang Kai shek was a corrupt, awful human being, okay? But the communists were worse. And the Chinese people threw in with Mao Zedong. And 20 million of them wound up face down in a gutter because of it. But you could have seen it coming where Chiang Kai-shek, all he wanted to do was steal from the people. Mao wanted to control every move you make. And if you didn't do what Mao wanted, you were dead. And a lot of that, uh, not to his extent, um, happened in these countries because the people just wouldn't accept the reality. And in America today, we are not accepting the reality of what the progressive movement is trying to impose upon us. And even worse, the free press, the corporate media is helping the progressives. And that is so dangerous to this nation. And that's why Trump is going to get the nomination, because Trump doesn't articulate it the way you and I do. He doesn't do that. But he comes across as an avenger against the progressive movement. And that's why his appeal is so much more than the other Democratic uh, Republican contenders. That's right. People people believe he's a fighter. Right. And he'll right the wrong. I mean, when when parents send their kids to an American school today, they are literally I mean, literally gambling with the life of their child. That child may well come home at the age of nine and say, if she's a girl, I am a boy. And and by the way, in California, where I live, and uh, some other states, 
the school has no obligation to tell the parents that their daughter says she is a boy. Right. And the uh, school district in Riverside are close by uh, passed an, uh, um, an ordinance that says you have to tell the parents. And the state of California is suing, I think it's a Chino mm-hmm. school district, suing the school district. That's right. But the people of California voted in these loons in Sacramento. Well, the people I mean, of, didn't uh, show up. The people of Philadelphia they, voted in their mayor. And the, the yeah, city, and Krasner, the, the guy who's yeah, destroying the right, city. That's right, Krasner, that's right. right. Right, right. So it's almost like we're Paul Revere's here. And when you write an entertaining book like Killing the Witches, where people will read the book, they're not looking for a political screed. They're looking for a interesting history. That message of evil, that message of acceptance of evil, which certainly the Puritans did, and Benjamin Franklin was one of the few who rebelled against it, and that's in the book as well, okay? When you accept evil, when you look away from it, it will grow. There's another parallel uh, to today's, uh, to the times in which we live today, and if you don't agree, of course, tell me, but in order to be accused of being a witch, since there's obviously, there's no such thing as evidence that you're a witch, it's, it's like can't say there's evidence that I'm an oak tree. There, there is no evidence. So the all it took was an accusation. That's all it takes today is an accusation, and your life is ruined. That's right, because the corporate media and the Internet, the social media, have no standards. None. Did you see what happened to me last week on CNN? Tell me. Okay. So... Right after Rupert Murdoch resigned as the chairman of Fox News, CNN primetime did a montage that's a series of sound bites for people appeared on Fox News. I was one of them. They used eight seconds of me. In those eight seconds, I said slaves were well fed and housed. That was the eight second sound bite. CNN used it to try to portray me as a racist, somebody who thought slavery was good. That's right. The body of the conversation was Michelle Obama's speech in 2016 where she said slaves built the White House. And my commentary was, she's right. They did. And here was the circumstance. Here's how they were dealt with uh-huh. when they were building the White House. That's right. Okay? Yes. And CNN so they had, consciously... Uh, uh-huh. right? that, that, I'm telling you the parallels. All over the Internet, it says, Dennis Prager wants to use the N-word. A caller called my show and asked me, how come I was citing McCullough's book on Truman, where, Tru- where Truman would use the word kike, which is the N-word of Jews, and the actual N-word? And I said, how come I could say kike and not the N-word? The, and I said, calling a black person the N-word is despicable, but that we can never say it, as I am now describing that Truman used the word kike, is absurd. All over the Internet. Dennis Prager wants to use the N-word. It's exactly what it's, happened to you with CNN. And that's evil. That's right. That's exactly It's lower right. level evil. It's not right. putting a rope around that, somebody's that's neck. That's right, yes. But there are that's varying right. degrees. Uh, we it. have one more segment, Bill O'Reilly. His book is Killing the Witches. The parallels are frighteningly accurate. But just as a history book alone... All his killing books are so worth it. Killing the Witches, Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard. I'm Dennis Prager. We return. Final segment of Bill O'Reilly. His latest, the 13th book in his killing series is Killing the Witches, the Salem Witch Trials. And uh, that's uh, Bill rustling rustling papers in the background. (laughs) That's me. <laughs> so, a lot of stuff. Yes, I could only imagine. Yep. The 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 parallels are are frightening. And incidentally, my my wife who listens to every show and is my 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 backup for all impertinent data. Uh, th- th- uh, I am'd me uh, just last segment. She was actually relieved to learn from you 
that the witches in Salem were not burned. It, it's it, it's it is a relief because that's such a horrific death. Yes, and it uh, it doesn't excuse anything. No, obviously, obviously. but there are there are here, gradations of evil. Here, here is a really interesting part of this. At the end of Killing the Witches, we bring you to Salem, Massachusetts today. It's about 25 miles north of Boston. The entire town is based on tourism for the witches. You drive in, it says, welcome to Salem, witch city. Huh. Now, it's got a pedestrian mall. It's got people, uh, storefronts who say they're witches. It's got whatever it is. In the month of October, leaving up to Halloween, they get millions of dollars poured in from tourists who go to Salem. We wanted to know from the mayor and the town council, hey, you feel a little uneasy because you're making millions of dollars off the corpses of people who are buried 600 yards away? They wouldn't talk to us. Interesting. Yeah. They don't want any part of that. And it's not their fault. I mean, I'd probably do the same thing. Salem, before they figured out the witch business, was a dying town. It was a mill town, and it was no more mill. But now it's a vibrant town. That's fascinating. Because yeah. this kind of occult, you know, is uh, attractive to many people. We have one minute left. I just want to say another parallel to today is... All you needed to do, I was about to say this when I said there's no, there's no such thing as a witch, but it didn't matter, is to be accused. Remember the Catholic boy that the national press accused of abusing that uh, the, the veteran? And it turned out everything yeah. about it was a lie. But it was the, a lie. But the kid's life was ruined at that time. Do you so, remember the McMartin story? Oh, in oh, LA? oh, please. Don't, don't, it, 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 don't, with the elephants in the classroom. How do you like yeah. that? Sneak an elephant into a classroom. Anyway, you're doing great work, Bill. Keep it up, and please con- consider the communism. There's a lot well, of killing. That's an excellent idea. Thank you, my friend. It's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of killing. Uh, and I just want to tell your audience that I admire you, Dennis, and I have for many years. Thank you for having me on. means a lot to me. Thank you. We continue. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Last night, I spoke at Arizona State University with Charlie Kirk, 37 professors at the Barrett Honors College, whose name is disgraced by these professors. But I talked a lot about that at the time, wrote publicly and told their students not to go. It was wrong for the university to even have us speak. As I mentioned last night... One of the biggest reasons is they fear correctly that 90 minutes from a Dennis Prager or a Charlie Kirk or a Jordan Peterson or a Ben Shapiro or a Heather Heather McDonald or a Michael Knowles or or Dave Rubin or Larry Elder. I mean, it's, it's such a long list. Just people off the top of my head will undo... The, the superficial, intellectually superficial world in which the left lives on campuses. We don't fear them speaking. They fear us speaking. So I didn't get to watch the debate as a result, but I read much of it, saw some excerpts. There was one truly great line, Vivek Ravaswamy This is a line worth remembering. And let's see here. Let me find it. I just had it. Why did I lose it? I understand that hardship is not a choice. But victimhood is a choice. That's really a great line. It's worth remembering. And the left teaches everybody except white heterosexual males to be a victim. For the first time in American history, 
To be a victim is the highest status. There's no doubt that part of the phenomenon of this vast increase, especially in young women saying that they are boys, girls who say they're boys, which has almost never occurred in history, it is now a phenomenon, is they want to leave the status or they want to gain the status of a victim. They're no longer just a white girl and therefore an oppressor. But now they're transgender. And boys who become homecoming queens at these various high schools. To be a kid today in the United States of America, in most cases, is a real challenge, unlike any in the past, including the Depression. Do you know, I read to you last week, the data that during the Depression, suicides decreased, depression decreased. We don't have a Depression or a World War II, and suicides and depression are massively increasing. The left has destroyed everything that gives a young person true joy. Patriotism, God, religion, the Bible, wholesome youth groups. LGBT, the new religion. LGBT. Some of the other uh, comments of the evening that I'd like to bring to your attention. All right, let's see here. Ron DeSantis. Well, the crime in these cities is one of the strongest signs of the decaying of America. That is correct. That is right. We can't be successful as a country if people aren't safe, even safe to live in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco. Just being in in Southern California, where I am, Over the last couple of days, my wife and I met three people who have been mugged on the street, and that would never have happened 10 or 20 years ago. In Florida, we back the blue. We support the men and women of law enforcement. They are keeping us safe. We have a 50-year low in the crime rate, and yes, when I had two progressive prosecutors that weren't following the law in Florida... I remove them from their posts, and the people of Florida are safer as a result of it. That's correct. Uh, Let's see, what other good quotes do we have here? By the way, uh, the the attacks on it and insults were a, a real, a terrible statement about the attacker and insulter. I, I have an, a, a real affection for Nikki Haley, and I thought that her comments about being dumber whenever, getting dumber whenever Vivek Rawaswamy speaks, had no, uh, no impact on Rawaswamy or support for Rawaswamy, but it definitely had an impact on support for her. Don't know when this began. Maybe it started with Donald Trump, by the way. You know, Donald Trump's insults were, of a, which I I, ne- I didn't appreciate at all. I, I still don't, and I thought he was a great president. G R E A T, great president. The country was thriving compared to under Democratic rule, but I didn't like that. But he got away with it in part because they they were witty and devastating and short. And that, that's his personality. But it's not her personality. And it wasn't witty. And it wasn't accurate. The fact where I was from, he does not make you dumber when he speaks. Nobody believes that. When 
when Donald Trump insulted Jeb Bush, I forgot the, the insult, but it, it was effective because a lot of people thought it was true. Here was Rawaswamy. The real divide is not between the Republicans on this stage. And in the Reagan Library, I want to say there are good people on the stage. These are good people on the stage. See, that's what they should all be saying. Compared to the Democrats, well, it's tough with Chris Christie. It's hard to call him a good person. Nevertheless, the point that Rawaswamy was making was good. The real divide is between the majority of us in this country who love the United States of America and share our founding ideals, free speech, meritocracy, the idea you get ahead in this country not on the color of your skin but on the content of your character, and the fringe, majority, the fringe minority in the Democrat Party that has a chokehold over that party. That's the real divide. Unfortunately, that this has a, they have a chokehold over the uh, the media, a chokehold over the educational system as well. Here's another line of DeSantis: "The people in Washington are shutting down the American dream with their reckless behavior. They borrowed, they printed, they spent, and now you're paying more for everything." They are the reason for that. They have shut down our national sovereignty by allowing our border to be wide open. So please spare me the crocodile tears for these people. They need to change what's going on. And where's Joe Biden? He's completely missing in action from leadership. And you know who else is missing? Well, then he spoke about Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record and so on. But that is the real divide, as he points out. 1-8 Prager 776. The governor of uh, North Dakota, Bergham, actually had some interesting points. The reason why people are striking in Detroit is because Joe Biden's interference with capital markets and with free markets. The subsidies were subsidizing the automakers and were subsidizing the cars and a particular kind of car, not every car, but particularly were subsidizing electric vehicles. And when you decide that we're going to take all of your taxpayer monies, take a billion dollars, subsidize a certain type of vehicle, and the batteries come from China, China controls 85% of the rare earth minerals. They're called rare earth because they're measured in parts per million. I'll continue. China controls 85% of the rare earth minerals. This is Governor of North Dakota, Bergam, last night. They, they're called rare earth because they're measured in parts per million. China is moving 100,000 pounds of earth in Indonesia, in Africa. They're literally destroying the planet so that we can make a battery that's in a car subsidized here. That's why they're striking, because they need two-thirds less workers to build an electric car. Joe Biden, this strike is at Joe Biden's feet. That's right. There's so much wrong with regard to the electric car. I don't know where to begin, but I've talked about it often. Governor Burgum made this case correct last night. Rawaswamy, if I were giving advice to those workers, I would say go pick it in front of the White House in Washington. That's really where the protest needs to be. Disastrous economic policies that have driven up prices, that have driven up interest rates and mortgage rates, at the same time wages remaining stagnant. What we need is to deliver economic growth in this country, unlock American energy, drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy, put people back to work by no longer paying them more money to stay at home, stabilize the U.S. dollar itself. And capitalism is still the best system known to man to lift us up from poverty 
and we should not apologize for it. When Pope Francis has repeatedly come out against capitalism because he's a leftist from Argentina, you realize it's so difficult to know what institution can you look for for moral leadership. And the answer is essentially no institution. You can look to individuals and you wonder, has it ever been different? Has it ever been different? The other day I was thinking, I'm attacked periodically by Christians and Jews. Uh, it's, it's not a lament, it's just an interesting point. For using the term Judeo-Christian. Because, of course, there are differences between Judaism and Christianity. I'm not even talking about theology. That's obvious. If they didn't have differences, they'd be one religion. Uh, But in terms of values, of course, there's Judeo-Christian values. But if you don't think that that's that's possible, then you can't even say then Jewish values, because Jews differ with other Jews. You can't say Christian values, because Christians differ with other Christians. Is it a Christian value to say that that capitalism is awful? Is that a Catholic value? The vicar of Christ on earth, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, says that capitalism is awful. So so is that a, a Catholic value? There, there's no group where everybody agrees, even on some major stuff, with one another. Individuals agree with one another. The world is divided between the decent and the indecent. There is, it is not divided between institutions. It's divided among people. The decent and the indecent, as Viktor Frankl put it in his great book, Man's Search for Meaning. And that's the way it is, my friends. Chicago, Illinois, John. The phone number here is 1-8-Prager-776. Haven't uh, taken... Uh, did I take any calls today? I didn't. Wow. But do we still pay our screener? So uh, are the screeners paid on the basis of numbers of calls taken? Or is it a flat rate? Suzette wishes it was per caller? Hmm. Well, all right. We have a GoFundMe page for our screeners, by the way. We do. Uh, Let's see. Chicago, Illinois. John, hello. Yeah, hi, Dennis. How you doing? I'm fine. My country isn't. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, I'm a first-time caller. And about my 20th time I got through, so I'm really happy. And that's really happy. not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I just, I'm watching the second debate, and of course the first as well. And I'm thinking, well, why isn't Larry Elder in the second debate? I was wondering that, why he wasn't in the first. And I had heard him on your show explaining it. I'm figuring he's going to be there. That's right. It's disgusting. It it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. He would revolutionize the event. Yes, he would. That's Every true. time he would talk, people would, would say, that's either, yeah, that's my Larry, or who the hell is that guy? Yeah. And their jaws would be dropped. That's yeah. right. That is correct. But the RNC doesn't want him up there, and I don't know why. Maybe he's an outsider. He's not a politician. I mean, neither is Rawaswamy, but he has his, his own following and independent means. It's it's really sad. It is really sad. That was my whole dream was to get Larry's ideas out there, which he uniquely can articulate. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, Hillsboro, Oregon, Diana. Hello. Oh hi. I I I've been a long time listener. I just wanted to say I really appreciate your views and your show. Thank you. Um, I um, have one of your books. I can't remember which one. It's one of the ones about the Bible. Nice. Um, and 
anyway, um, I just wanted to say we haven't had a Republican governor since Victor Atia. When was that, in 1873? (laughs) 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 No, that was... That was Julius Meyer. Well, well, no, we had Julius Meyer back in the 30s, and he had to run as uh, independent because the uh, Dems and the Republicans didn't want to do on their ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, a, a Republican governor of Oregon. Back in a moment. Well, you know, the uh, U.S. Senate has now unanimously voted to retain a dress code for its members. So, of course, the Atlantic, which has a lot of leftists writing for it, has this woman write an article, Caitlin Flanagan. That's her name. Staff writer for the Atlantic. She's thrilled As a young person, she's thrilled with getting rid of the dress code, which has just been reinstated. The elimination of the dress code could be one small step toward making Congress more relevant to young people. It will make the institution seem less formal, less impenetrable. That's what they said. That's exactly. This is such a Marxist brain at work here. Remember the Mao suits? Remember how they got rid of Western garb, the suit and tie? Because that was bourgeois. So let's become more relevant. Let's look like the people and let's all dress similarly with the Mao suit. Uh, this is This is the thinking. The suit and tie is a remnant of capitalism, of Judeo-Christian Western civilization, of everything the left loathes. Remember, the left, the left builds nothing and destroys everything. Tell me something good the left has built. I'm not talking about liberals, I'm talking about the left. I'll give you some time here. Zach, I think you should play Haydn's cello concerto while people think because a beautiful background can help the mind really it's an interesting question isn't it what has the left built other than gulags name me a good thing the left has built That's not a high cello concerto. You're trying to trick me, right? I know my music. Anyway, we'll continue with the, with this article here in the Atlantic. Getting salute to getting rid of the dress code because having people wear hoodies and shorts, like this nihilist from Fetterman from Pennsylvania, changing the dress code, however, is only a half measure, because there was no way of getting around the problem of the capital itself. The left fights really important things. This is an example. There is so much garbage in the Atlantic that it is amazing to me that they print this stuff. Who thinks this is admirable? Oh, the capital itself is a problem with its Latin. Read it. Listen. With its Latin inscriptions. Ah, I told you they hate the West. When I say the, the left wants to destroy the West, I mean it literally. It is not an attack. It is a fact. Latin inscriptions. Marble staircases. Graven images of slaveholding presidents. I see. So the fact that they had slaves, which the whole world did at that time, virtually the whole world, and but they made the society that abolished slavery, that ultimately elected 
the only white society to ever elect a black president. I don't know of any black society that elected a white president. I don't expect them to. There are very few whites in Africa, outside of South Africa. But uh, it's it isn't the issue with public figures what they built. Why, why don't they? Why don't they say uh, marble statues of uh, graven images of adulterous presidents? Right. If, if you're going to talk about the the private sins of an individual, well, I guess slaveholding is a public sin, and it is a sin. It's a horrible thing. But you judge people of the past by the past, not by the present. Which means that this writer for the Atlantic does not believe that there should be any statues of George Washington in the United States Capitol. That's The Atlantic for you. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.